Well, um, I will be speaking about the, uh, the new access control syntax in Apache HTTPD 2.4, and I'll try very hard not to get distracted by, by the noise. Um, it is uh, both helpful and uh, a little bit intimidating that uh, several of the people that are responsible for this code are sitting in the audience, so they can, they can correct me when I make errors and uh, laugh at me as well. So uh, that's all part of the fun. I'm going to be talking about several general categories of things in this talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about the past. And then I'm going to jump into the new syntax in 2.4 for access control. Um, the LDAP portion ended up being a substantial part of the content, so I'm calling that out separately. And then I'm also going to be talking about mod sessions and the new cookie auth stuff that's in 2.4. So these are the, the major categories, and uh, if that's not what you're interested in, there are other great talks going on right now. Uh, I want to make explicit up front, just I'm sure you all know this, but authentication and authorization are two separate things in, you know, both in concept but also in implementation in the web server. The, uh, the authentication phase is run and then after that's done, the authorization phase is done and they may or may not have anything to do with one another. Authentication asks the question, who are you? And the answer to that can be achieved a number of different ways, usually in the web server world, who are you, is answered by a username and password. But it may also be answered by an RSA token or um, a driver's license or a passport. The are you allowed to be here question may or may not have anything to do with the authentication question. Are you allowed to be here um, may have to do with the time of day or your IP address. And then there's this general concept of access control, which may or may not have anything to do with either thing. There may be access control measures that have nothing to do with the individual user. They may have to do with the fact that the building is on fire, and so we want to keep you out. So what were we trying to fix um, in 2.2 and earlier? The access control syntax was confusing and it was limited. Uh, people would frequently have trouble understanding how they were supposed to express themselves in the access control syntax. They would frequently get it wrong. In the time that I've been working on the documentation, the doc that describes the order directive has been corrected several times by people who didn't really understand it. They ended up reversing the meaning of it and submitting a patch. And we would say, no, it was actually right before, but maybe we can make it less confusing. In the 2.4 version, changes hopefully make it much easier to use, but also much more flexible in the concepts that you can express. You can, you can create access control situations that express a much finer grain of, of control over who can get in. So in 2.2 and earlier, we had four main directives that specified access control. The order, allow, deny, and satisfy directives. The order directive, um, you can think of this in terms of how you might set up firewall rules. You can either deny everything and then allow selectively, or you can allow everything and then deny the bad stuff. And there are situations where each one of these is, is relevant. It's not that one is better than the other. There are situations where each is relevant. So in the order directive, the allow deny specifies that you apply all of the specified allow rules, and then you go back and apply all the deny rules. And this becomes confusing when you are merging multiple sections of your configuration. Suppose you have overlapping directory blocks. You have allow and deny directives in one and then some more in another. The allow directive, I'm sorry, the order directive specifies the, the order in which those are applied to the specific request under consideration. 
The default behavior, when you say allow deny, the default behavior is to deny everything. And then the reverse is true of deny allow. Uh, quite apart from the confusion surrounding this, the syntax itself is deny comma allow with no spaces. And uh, that's a frequent syntax error in configuration files. So this often confused people. Um, the, the syntax for specifying what is to be allowed goes something like this. You can say allow from all and deny from all, which mean exactly what you expect. You can allow or deny from an address where this is either an IP address or a host name or a partial IP address or host name. And you can allow or deny from an environment variable which means that you uh, can specify an environment variable either is defined or has a particular value and use that as access control. And then finally, the satisfy directive specified how many of the rules you had to honor. So if you say satisfy all, it means that every rule, every allow directive that is specified must be true in order for access to be granted. If you will say satisfy any, then one of the above is fine. So here's an example of that. This is a, an access control block for the dashboard of your website. And you want to allow it, you want to allow anyone within your company to access it freely. Or if they're not inside your company, you want to make sure that they are an admin. So we say, First of all, we say deny allow, saying that we want to deny everything by default and then selectively allow things. So I'm going to deny from all and then I'm going to allow people on my network and I'm going to allow group admins. Finally, I say satisfy any, which means any of the above is sufficient. So if they're on a 10.1 address, I don't bother asking for a username. But if they're not, then I'm going to have an a authentication dialogue and ask for a login and check that they're an admin. Here's an example of using an environment variable as access control. Again, this is 2.2 syntax, 2.2 and earlier. I'm going to use the set env if directive to say if the user agent field matches the regular expression bad bot, then I'm going to set an environment variable called go away. And then I say deny from environment variable equals go away. And this is a, a simple way to restrict access from a certain user agent. In, in addition to the allow and deny syntax, there's also in 2.2 and earlier a require keyword. And the require keyword is for uh, user-based authentication. So we can say require valid user, which means anyone that successfully puts in a password is going to be allowed. We can allow a specific user, or we can allow, we can require a particular group of users. So anyway, that's the way that it is prior to 2.4. And if, if you want to have a particularly complex situation where you want to require um, more than just a handful of, of things, you want to say, well, I want them to be in the marketing group. I don't want them to be somebody that's only been on staff for two weeks. Um, and I want them to be in this particular part of my building. And you know, things start getting to the point where you can no longer express them in the 2.2 and earlier syntax. So in 2.4, there's a couple new keywords that have been introduced. The require keyword is still around, but it is much more flexible than it used to be. And we've introduced these three new sections, require any, require all, and require none, which mean exactly what they say. The, uh, the directives are defined in a module called mod authz core. If you look at a list of Apache modules, you'll see a bunch of them start with mod auth n, 
and a bunch of them start with mod auth z. The auth n ones are for authentication, specifically for user user based authentication. The auth z ones are for authorization. And then there's the special case mod LDAP, moth authen z LDAP, which handles both of those things all together because LDAP is a special case. All right, here is the syntax. Require, you can optionally put a not in there to negate it. And then there is some entity, some, some attribute that we are going to consider. And then there's a value, possibly, that we're going to check to see if it's set. So we'll start with the basic one. Require all granted and require all denied are the replacement for the old allow from all, deny from all syntax. Next we have environment variable requirements. Require environment something. So here's a, a, a comparable example to the one that I showed you a little bit earlier. Um, I'm going to use the set env if directive again to set a environment variable called let me in. And if you don't specify a value, it sets it to true or to one. And then I say require environment variable let me in. So this reduces the, uh, the four line example from before to a two line example. But it's not merely about lines of configuration. It's also about the clarity of expression. Uh, the, the order deny, deny allow and the deny from all um, kind of gets in the way of understanding what exactly is going on here. So we're simply saying require this environment variable. The implication is everything else is, is denied. Okay. The next thing that we've got is a module called mod auth z host. Uh, mod auth z core implements the basic require syntax. Any other module can extend that to add its own require keywords. So this is the first of the modules that does that. This is mod auth z host. And it says require, it has, it has two keywords that you can use here. The first one is require IP. And uh, when you use the require IP syntax, you can express the network address in pretty much any syntax you can think of. You can use a full IP address or a partial IP address or a bit mask. Um, you can use IPv6 or IPv4 addresses and it'll do the right thing. You can also specify host names. You can specify a, a partial host name or a fully qualified host name to say, I want to require the host example.org or any, any hosts that are in that domain. Um, I'm also going to exclude anything that is in a .ru domain. It's, it's worth noting at this point that you want to avoid name-based access control if at all possible. Um, the main reason for that is performance. Anytime that you introduce DNS into the equation, you are introducing a delay that you have no control over. Um, this is doubly true when you do name-based authentication because when you do a host lookup, when we have, for example, requirehostexample.org, we take the IP address of the client and we do a DNS lookup on it and see what host name comes back. However, if you're familiar with DNS, you know that if you own an IP address, you can put any reverse lookup you want with that IP address. So we don't trust that. We uh, take that host name, we do a reverse lookup on it again to see what IP address comes back and make sure that they match. And if that's not the case, then we go ahead and deny it anyway, no matter what they told us their, their pointer address was. There's one special syntax that comes in mod auth z host, and that's require local. And this is a little bit more intelligent than simply saying 
require a 127.001. It will allow any connections from anything in the 127 network or anything that has a, uh, a local host IPv6 address or even something where the client and server have the same network address. So it, it does a little bit more intelligent calculation there when you say require local. It's really important to remember that if you are proxying content, if you have a proxy pass back to a service on the same box, then all your connections come from local. So you want to be real careful about using require local in that kind of a context. So the next piece of uh, the next require syntax looks very much like what you're already used to from 2.2 and before. You can require a user. You can require valid user, which means anyone that successfully logged in. The new syntax here is require not user, which creates a, a blacklist of specific users or groups that you're going to exclude. But this syntax should look very familiar if you've been around HTTPD for a while. Um, on the other hand, if you're upgrading from an earlier version of HTTPD, you may not be familiar with the, uh, the syntax that you see here. So let me walk through this a little bit here. Um, the first line is which authentication protocol we're going to use. And in this case, we're using BASIC. The, the two main HTTP protocols are BASIC and Digest. And the BASIC authentication protocol uh, is what's going on most of the time when you see a pop-up password dialog on a website. It asks for your credentials, and then it passes those credentials plain text to the server. Um, the other thing that happens is that the browser will cache your username and password it will associate it with the host, the host name, the, IP, the address that you're visiting, and also the auth name. You'll see that auth name in that password dialog. The browser will cache that information and continue to send it with every subsequent request to the same website. So when you're on a, uh, an open wireless network, like at this conference, you can watch traffic going by and and snag all the usernames and passwords of sites that are using basic authentication without SSL. So that's an important thing to be aware of. There's another authentication protocol called Digest, which does a better job of this. It hashes the username and password and uh, makes it significantly more difficult to harvest that. The next keyword down here is auth basic provider. And the auth basic, auth basic provider keyword was added in 2.2. And it reflects the fact that you can now store authentication credentials in a number of different backends. That can be file, DBM, or DBD, or LDAP. Um, in this particular case, I have to specify the DBM type and the file path to where I'm actually storing the, uh, the password. So that's a, that's a fairly typical authentication configuration block. Um, if you wish to require a group, the group syntax is fairly simple. What you see at the top there is a group file, and it lists the group name, and then a space separated list of everyone that is in that group and you can have as many groups as you want in a given group file. That can be stored in a flat text file or it can be stored in a, in a DBM and uh, can be used for group-based authentication. Next we have mod auth z method, I believe it's called that uh, does HTTP method-based access control. So in this example here, I say require method get post options, and that denies access in any other HTTP method. So that's pretty straightforward. 
And then one of the major new features in 2.4 is the expression engine. This allows us to use arbitrarily complex logical expressions at various places in the configuration file. And one of those is in access control. So here we have require expression, and then I have a expression talking about the time of day. This particular one denies access outside of business hours to uh, whatever resource it is that we're protecting here. So now I've got several different ways that I can express this. The first example here is in 2.2 syntax, using order and deny and allow. And then I have two different ways that I can express a very similar thing uh, using 2.4 syntax. I can either use, uh, I can either set an environment variable, or I can directly use an expression to compare the value of the environment variable to a regular expression. Um, I guess there's really not any difference between those two. Uh, if you're going to use the environment variable somewhere else, you might want to use the set envif version. If it's just a one-off comparison, you might want to use the expression. Whichever one works best with your brain as you, as you look into writing these configuration bits. So next we come on the, uh, the bigger advantage of this system, and that's the ability to, com to combine several different access control mechanisms in a single statement. And there's three syntaxes for this. The first one is require all. Require all says anything that is in this block must be enforced. So in this case, I'm saying you have to be on our network on the 10.2 network, and you must also be in the admins group. And this is identical to the old satisfy all syntax. Next we have require any, and this is the same as the old satisfy any syntax. So here I'm saying it's sufficient either that you're on my 10.2 network or that you're an admin. It's not necessary that you be both. One or the other is fine. Um, so, you know, here's an example in a directory block. I have an uploads directory. If, uh, if you are simply retrieving content from the uploads directory, I don't care who you are, but if you are doing something else, like doing a post method, I need you to be authenticated. And so if you do, any, if you do a post or a put, it's going to say, uh, well, now I need require valid user, so I'm going to ask you for your credentials. So uh, let's compare these two blocks, and you'll notice that the line count is essentially, well, it's one line less. But here again, it's not about the line count so much as about the clarity of expression. We don't waste time on the, the uh, seemingly unnecessary deny and order lines. We just get straight to the point, we say, uh, require any one of these two, and then we put that in a directory block. Finally, we have the require none block, which says none of the things in this group are allowed to be true and still allow access. So in this case, um, in my LDAP directory, I have two different ways to indicate that someone is a temporary worker. They can either be in the group temps, or they can have a common name of temporary employees. And uh, neither one of those is acceptable for my particular situation. I don't want either one of those groups of people to have access to the content. And up until now, all of that we could have done with the old syntax. It might have been a bit of a stretch, but we could have done it. But what the new syntax allows you to do is nest several of these together in a very complex way and enforce extremely fine-grained control. So here's an example of that. Um, this is a, an LDAP 
authentication, I'm sorry, access control block authorization uh, that, that requires a variety of different conditions to be true before we allow someone access to our content. And, uh, you know, at first glance that may seem a little bit baffling, but if you look at each individual section, you can understand what each individual section is doing. So we're saying either they need to be an admin or in the group admin or in sales and they need to not be a temp worker. And we combine all of these together in a way that ensures that only the very specific people that I'm interested in can get in and no one else can. So this brings me to LDAP. Uh, Mod AuthNZ LDAP is a, a new module in 2.2 which got a lot more love in 2.4 and I'm going to show you some of the syntax there. This is a basic LDAP authentication directive. I point it at my LDAP server with an LDAP URL and I say I want a valid user. Um, going back to the example that I gave earlier, you can see I also have the auth basic provider here and the provider in this case is LDAP. And so this is going to go off to my LDAP server, whatever it is, and pass the, the user provided credentials onto that server to make sure that they're allowed in. There's a number of different syntaxes you can use to query your LDAP server. The first one of these is simply require valid user. And uh, that means did they log in okay. I can also specify require LDAP user. And this is going to be the difference between a, uh, a user ID and a user's common name in the LDAP directory. Or I can do an LDAP group. And um, for people that are familiar with LDAP, you can get pretty fine grained when you build LDAP groups. Groups are built on, on queries or on lists and so you can be very fine grained there and who is in that. Uh, you can use a LDAP distinguished name, which is different potentially from their group or their common name. You can build this on a particular LDAP attribute. So uh, perhaps you have, you just have a flag on certain ones of your users, you can now do access control based on that. And then you can finally, you can do an LDAP filter. So this particular example here from the documentation is, uh, I, I want to do access control based on anyone that's in marketing and has a cell phone on file. And it does that query on the LDAP backend and returns uh, whether they're valid or not. In the LDAP URL itself, um, if, if you're used to building LDAP URLs, you can, you can put the query in there. In this case, I've, I've put the uh, I've put some additional detail in the LDAP URL and I'm going to query by user ID rather than by common name. Um, it's it's uh, important when you're using common name against LDAP to remember that there are actually cases where two people have the same name. So you need to make sure that, that you're very cautious when you use common name as an authentication source. Here's one for anyone that carries a pager that's very similar to the, uh, to the uh, cell phone example a little bit earlier. And this would be a case where you've actually created an LDAP attribute that you associate with people that carry a pager. Um, if you want to use Active Directory as your LDAP backend, there's a couple things that you have to do different. Well, just one actually you need to uh, use the user principal name argument to the LDAP URL and that makes it play friendly with, uh, with HTTPD's access control. Another great new module is uh, AuthZ, mod AuthZ DVD. 
And this allows you to do authentication queries against any RDBMS. Uh, I'm not sure what the full list is at the moment, but I know you can do authorization against uh, MySQL and Postgres and Oracle, I believe. I think so. Um, anyway, here is a, a DBD configuration, and this is split over several different slides, so I want to talk about each bit of it a little bit differently. First of all, you're going to have your basic DBD configuration. And so you're going to have your database name, username, and password there in your HTTPD configuration file. So it becomes really important that you keep that file uh, well secured and not readable by people who might not need to see this information. We then have some process management stuff configured here. ModDBD is a database pooling manager, and it, it maintains the various connections to the database and then allows other modules to pass queries through them. So those, those first three directives there indicate the minimum and maximum number of connections that I want to keep in my pool at any time. And uh, huh, I'm drawing a blank. What's the DBD keep for? I forget what that one means. Um, I'd have to look that up. You can look that up. The DBD keep, I forget what that directive does. Um, but the other two there maintain, they, they configure mod DBD, how large it keeps its pool of connections, and it will, uh, it will spawn and reap additional threads as needed based on load. Then we have the expiration time on a, on a DBD connection, and it, it uh, will close a connection that's been idle for a certain amount of time. Then here's uh, the actual configuration block that, that applies DBD-based authentication to a particular resource. So I'm specifying there the directory path. And uh, once again, I have auth type basic. And this time, the auth basic provider is DBD. It tells it we're going to use mod DBD for the queries. I then have two separate queries that I've specified here. One is the one that will verify the username and password. So that's the DBD user password query. And you'll notice that uh, it's actually checking to see that there's a value called login equals true. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment. <clears throat> and then we have the, uh, the authorization where it's checking what group they are a member of. And we're going to check against that for authorization as well as for authentication. Uh, I've specified a 401 document that sends them to a page that, that tells them why they couldn't log in. That's, that's always a friendly thing to do. And then I've got two files blocks. Um, I'm going to have a login.html and a logout.html. And these are uh, what they sound like. One of them is the login page. And I have the, the query that says, select the password where the user's provided. And then I require this, new, this method called DVD login. And that is the, the method within AuthZDVD that verifies their username and password based on the queries that I've provided here. And then se the second there is a logout, a DVD logout that uh, that also that, that clears the login value on their, D, on their database record. And I've also got a, a query there that actually does that. You can tailor that to your particular database needs. So this is considerably more complicated than some of the other ones, but um, what, what we've found over the years is that uh, basic and digest authentication are all well and good, but most people are implementing their own authentication on the server side anyway. They've got in-page authentication forms. And this lowers the barrier to developing that. It also provides a, a framework that is well tested and um, hopefully more secure than something that, that uh, junior developers are rolling on their own.
And speaking of which, we've got another new module that does session-based authentication. And this is introduced in 2.4. There's actually two modules involved in this. The first one is Mod Sessions. And Mod Sessions doesn't do authentication. Mod Sessions just does the session stuff. So uh, here's how you use this. If you want to turn on Sessions, you say Sessions On. You specify the name of the session cookie. And in this case, I'm calling it the unimaginative name of session. And then I specify the path for which that cookie is valid. In this case, I'm specifying a path of slash. So the cookie is good for my whole site. And then next, I specify a header. And you can make up whatever header name you want, or you can use this, this one that's uh, you know, as good as any other. And that header means what header should I send to the client, uh, or rather, what header should I send in order to reset or replace the session data? And then if you want to do that, here's an example from a Perl CGI program, just to keep it simple. But you can do this from any, any language, of course. Um, in your PHP application or whatever, you can send a header and set the value of the session cookie. And in this case, I'm, I'm using the X replace session header that I configured in the session header directive. I'm sending data in a query string style format because that's the way that cookies store data. If you want to read information back out of the session, you do that via the environment variable HTTP underscore session. And, uh, you also need to set the session env cookie on in order to tell HTTPD to set that environment variable. So then in your application, you have access to that session variable. You can read to it and also write to it. The second module that hooks in with this, and these, these two modules were donated at the same time, the second one is mod auth form. And this is a module that takes care of the actual uh, form handling side and setting the session data in the cookies. So here's how you would configure this. Auth form provider file means that we're going to store our username and password information in uh, a flat file. You can also store it in a DBM. Um, or in, in uh, DBD, you can use any of the auth providers for this. It uses the standard auth provider syntax. In this case, since I'm using file, I specify a file path to that user file, conf password. And then the auth type is form, which means that you actually have to go put a form in your HTML to send us the authentication credentials. Um, the form login location is where to send them if they fail to log in. And then we turn on sessions and say where we're going to store the cookie. Your form looks like a pretty standard password dialog form. Uh, you do need to use the, uh, the username and password, the, the correct names for the username and password fields, and that's httpd underscore username and http underscore password. And uh, then you can stick this in your, in your web page and you have authentication for free without having to go develop that yourself. Um, the form action is pointing to this do login.html, which is not actually an HTML file on disk. It is instead this location directive. And this location directive is pointing at the uh, mod auth form handler the form login handler. There's several different things that I can set there. There's the, uh, the, the, lo the location of the login form, where to direct them on success, and uh, right, where to redirect them on failure as well as success. The login.html is where they go. They go back to the login form if the authentication failed. 
So that right there is all that's involved in setting up session-based, form-based authentication now. You can also specify in the form itself where you want to send them on success, and that is the httpd underscore location argument that you put in the form, and that way you can have a single login form handler handling multiple different authentication forms. Another big advantage of this module is that you can, you can you do a logout handler as well, and uh, you provide a, yeah, another location that is attached to the form logout handler handler. And then once again, you, you give it a, a loc location where you're going to send them once they have successfully logged out. When someone hits this URL, you set the session max age to one, indicating that that session is going to expire immediately or after one second. And uh, now they're logged out. All right, here's one more syntax that's available. Uh, were there any, any questions about anything I've covered so far? I can't see anyone, so I can't see if, if I'm making sense to people. Oh, okay, all right. Another great new syntax in the 2.4 release is the if directive. And um, this gives you yet another way that you can specify your access control requirements. Here's two examples that say the same thing. The first one, I'm using a require any to say I need it to be either a particular time of day or I need them to be in the group admins. I can say that differently as if it's not during business hours, then require group admins. And this, this uh, gives you several different ways that you can think about the same access control requirement and express it in ways that make sense to you. So now one more thing that you need to think about is when you are upgrading from 2.2 to 2.4, you don't want your website to break on the first day as soon as you install the upgrade. So ideally you do this on a test server and you get everything working there, right? But if you don't have that luxury, there is a module called Mod Access Compat. And by enabling Mod Access Compat, you can continue to use the old authentication format while you're getting your configuration file to the point where it does the right thing. So simply loading this module will allow you to continue to use the order, deny, allow, satisfy syntax. Uh, I wanted to mention one other um, interesting directive that I stumbled across while I was preparing this talk, and this is auth send forbidden on failure directive. This would be something that you might use if you had a single set of user authentications for your whole website, but different users are able to access different parts of the website. So you have a successful authentication, but you have different authorization requirements. And this will return a 403 unauthorized saying, yes, you've successfully authenticated, but you're not authorized. Um, the downside of this is if you use it in the wrong place, you might tell someone, yeah, the password that you just guessed was right, but you're not allowed in. And that gives, that gives an attacker more information than they really needed. And then um, I wanted to also mention that if you are a fan of mod rewrite, you can use the expression syntax within mod rewrite to, to create access control, um, which is something that wasn't available in 2.4, this expression syntax. So in this case, I've got the same example that I was showing earlier, but using mod rewrite as the uh, conveyor of that information, I can use an expression in a rewrite condition, and that should say rewrite cond, there should be a D there, got a typo on the slide. So, you all have been very, very quiet. Um, 
Are there any questions? And once again, I'm finishing a little earlier than I had hoped because I tend to expect a little bit of heckling from the crowd. But uh, does anybody have any, any questions or comments or whatever? Is anyone awake? <laughs> All right, great. The require blocks, you know, the new stanzas, uh, they clearly have a scope. They, they clearly can be scoped to a directory or a location or whatever. Um, the impression that I've got, and I could be wrong on this and stuff, the rewrite rules have always had a scope of basically the entire virtual host. Am I correct? Well, on that's, that? that's something that you can configure. You can put one of these, um, you can put one of these rewrite. It, 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 not, notwithstanding rewrite condition, but so you know, here's a here's an example of using the uh, the required syntax within a directory block, and so you can scope that to whatever right. level you want. You can put require in a location or directory block. You can also put rewrite rules in a directory block. What what, what I was trying to lead. I'm up sorry, to, maybe I misunderstood. What, what what I was trying to lead up to was the. The, you gave an example where you showed using the, a require block with some condition, I think it was the time of day uh, condition in it, mm -hmm. versus an if block with the condition in it. And so the question that I have is, clearly that require block can be scoped to location, to directory, and so forth. Yes. The if seemed to be more related to mod rewrite in the earlier talk, at least the way I perceived it. So does it have the same scoping within location, directory, and yeah, so forth? Yeah, you, you can put an if block in a directory or a location, or it, it can only, be global. And it only applies to that directory. That's correct. So, it only but, applies to that scope. But you can't do that with a rewrite rule, because that really gets done before it even knows what directory, right? Yeah. Um, you can put rewrite rules in a directory or location block. Um, it's a little bit, it's a, there's no downside to putting a, a rewrite rule in a directory block, mm -hmm. um, except that it doesn't run until you are mapped to that directory. Right. Putting it in a location block is a little bit redundant because mm -hmm. by the time you get to a location, you've already, hmm, let's see, which way around would that go? I guess if you wanted to, if you wanted to scope a rewrite rule to a location, you'd probably express that in a rewrite condition instead of a location. Right. So, so, so basically, the rewrite rule scope is your entire virtual host. Typically, yes. And, and, but, but if does tie to a smaller scope if you encase it in a stanza. Yeah, typically. Okay. And, and, but in both cases, you can use them whichever, whichever way you want. But yes, that is the typical use case. Okay. Uh, I had a, a question about the authentication form. Uh, isn't it strange that the field names just start by HTTPD? So everyone knows you run Apache, Apache and the other one, uh, a hidden field to uh, give the next location after login is quite strange now. I'm afraid I'm, I'm having trouble hearing the, the question. <laughs> uh, could you go to the authentication form slide? The form authentication Yes, yeah, so Rich, you remember on the form authentication, right? You showed an example form, and you said these input fields have to be un httpd underscore this yeah. and httpd underscore that, right? So regardless of your server signature and all that stuff, that identifies the web server to someone who wants to know what you're running. That's certainly true. Yeah, I guess that is true. And those, those form fields are not configurable as far as I know. So maybe that would be a, a good feature request going forward is to make that configurable. Um, hadn't thought of that. All right, well, um, Igor, you have a question? Um, what is your advice to somebody 
trying to migrate a really, really, really big and complex um, infrastructure with lots and lots of authentication and authorization from 2.2 to 2.4. Um, so that's, that's a really very broad question. Um, I, I guess my recommendation would be that initially they use mod, ox, mod access compat to ensure that things just keep on working, but uh, then take it one byte at a time to try to migrate the, the individual parts. But, you know, it might also be a great opportunity to see if they can simplify their their over complex uh, authentication scheme, if that's possible. I don't know, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to answer a question like that without seeing a specific scenario. But uh, I would think mod access compat would be the right answer in, in the short term anyway. Well, thank you all very much. Um, the slides for this presentation are at this very moment. Oh, I lost my screen. The slides are at that location. And uh, thank you all very much.